Daisy. And I'm Terry. And this is the Monday, Monday Mindset, Mindset Podcast, Podcast, where we share things of interest to us and hopefully to you. So let's get started with episode number 193. And today it is Terry's turn to share something. Terry, what do you have? I have a feeling it's another new one. <laughs> <laughs> it is. I've been a little bit on a kick of just trying to find some new things to listen to. So I, I happened upon a podcast called Every Day Better with Leah Smart. And one of the things that drew me to it is the topic was about behavior change. And that's, you know, kind of a pet topic in my work. It was an episode from January 9th. So beginning of the new year, everyone working on their resolutions and things. So the title of this episode is called Beyond Resolutions, Annie Grace's Guide to Conscious Behavior Change. I'm like, okay, sign me up. Let's dig into this. Then when I read a little bit about the topic, I thought, mm, I don't know if this is one that will reach enough of our listeners, but I, I think it really will because the topic is about Annie Grace, the guest, and she is the author of a book called This Naked Mind. And she, in the write-up, says that she offers a unique approach to understanding and transforming our subconscious beliefs and habits. So again, right up my alley. However, the, the focus of this episode that they were talking about primarily is around alcohol use. Okay. And so I thought, wow, oh, is this really going to tap into enough of our listeners if that's not their area of struggle or concern or something for them? But the things that she talks about in relation to alcohol are very applicable to any areas in our lives that we're not pleased with the way it's going or, you know, we might feel kind of stuck or maybe we are almost blind to the fact that it's interfering for us. So I thought, yes, this will be a topic that will work for any of our listeners. Well, then it's funny, isn't it? How many conversations we've had actually quite recently about talking about trying to explain to other people or trying to get the message home. And how often do we say, replace that food group with alcohol and suddenly the argument mm -hmm. becomes clearer. That's right. So actually that was the first thing that came to my mind yeah. that it can be applied quite well often. And I think, you know, there are several books that I talk a lot about in my work with clients that are about alcohol but they are not working on their issues with alcohol with me. We're working on issues with food or other behaviors. Mm. So I, I think it's one that all of us can benefit from thinking about. And the host of the show talked a little bit too, just about this podcast in general and what she's focusing on this year. So what she talked about overall for her show, her podcast this year, she really wants to focus on kind of this idea of, you know, in the beginning of the year, oftentimes people are focused on resolutions. Who do they want to become? What do they want to accomplish this year? What do they want to change? So she said she's focusing on four primary categories this season, physical health, emotional health, relational health, and work health. And so each episode will be in one of these categories. So this one that I chose is in the category of physical health, but I think it's much bigger than that as well. So Annie Grace, the guest, the author of the book that I mentioned, she gave her a little bit of an introduction and she talked about the fact that she was a very high performing marketing executive, very busy, very active, very vibrant. She's a wife, she's a mom. It's kind of like, you know, doing it all and doing it all well, except she was also hiding the fact that she was a functional alcoholic. Mm -hmm. And so she talked about that if you read her book and really get into listening to her, you can learn so much about um, a way to approach these things in life, even if it's not about alcohol. So she found that even reading this book, she learned a lot, even though it might not change her relationship completely with alcohol. So I'll go into that a little bit later. 
So Annie first came in and just started talking about like how she developed alcoholism, like how it kind of started for her because she said, look, I didn't drink much in high school. I didn't drink much in college. But then once I was a professional out there, started getting invited to happy hours and, you know, people would say, oh, have another drink and oh, have this. And so she kind of felt like she needed to. So she started drinking a little more and then she would leave and she kind of got pulled aside by one of the bosses who said, wait, why aren't you going? This is happy hour. And she said, well, because I, I don't really drink. I don't want to drink much. He said, oh, no, no, you don't understand. This is where you're going to make your connections. Wow. This is where the business really happens. Mm-hmm. So again, in her mind, all of the things that alcohol meant kind of took a back seat because it became imperative that if you're not there drinking, you're missing out on work, you're not being a good worker, you're not going to advance. And so this is really important in this episode because much of what they talked about is that when we want to change something in our life, oftentimes we're really at a kind of crossroads because we have a belief that that behavior is necessary, Mm -hmm. that it might even be our only behavior that is an option based on the scenario. And that makes it really complicated. What do I do then if it's causing me problems? So she did a lot of research and really started looking at this and, um, In her book, the two of them talk about really, it's not about quitting alcohol. So if you're hearing this and you're thinking, oh, I don't think I really have a problem with alcohol. I I don't think this book is for me or whatever. That really what they described it as, it's more that it fosters a deeper understanding of your relationship with alcohol. And as you mentioned, Daisy, we could substitute in a deeper understanding of our relationship with food deeper understanding of our relationship with spending money, whatever the behavior is. And really, again, she's not so much telling everyone they should become abstinent from alcohol, but instead she wants to help people in making more informed, conscious decisions that are aligned with their goals and values rather than being kind of just driven by these subconscious decisions that they really don't spend any time deciding because it's so automatic. And one of the things that she described that I thought was really kind of powerful is most of us have messages from society. We have conditioning and beliefs that can cause us to do things that really aren't in our best interest. They don't serve us well. We might not even enjoy them or we might not enjoy the outcomes of them, but it is so easy for us to get trapped in the patterns of these behaviors and even addictions. And again, this is kind of her example of of drinking. She didn't go about thinking, man, drinking is great and I wanna do this whenever I can. It wasn't in her repertoire but it became important because of the work environment. Now, once she really got going with it at work, she started drinking at home. And then she said, I started to rely on it for all things. This was going to relax me with my kids. This was going to make it easier for me to relax in bed with my husband, like all kinds of reasons now that alcohol became this necessary, important, natural thing to her. As you could see how it would creep up on you. Absolutely. By becoming almost a necessity as part of your job. Absolutely. And then you start to rely on it. Absolutely. And then she said, you know, as with many other things, and I, of course, the whole time in thinking about our relationship with food and how this influences us. Mm. And she said, you know, at some point she realized that it was a problem, that there were starting to be some consequences for it. She didn't like that. So she needed to change it. So of course, what's the first option? She says to herself, oh, well, I'm just going to start drinking less. That'll do it. But what she realized is that making that decision really kicked off some arguments in her mind because as she was setting out to change this behavior, it was creating internal conflict. So what she realized is that this decision this internal conflict that it created was that now she was going to not do something that she wanted to do and that she had also come to believe was vital 
It was helpful. It was necessary. It was the only way. So it wasn't just like, you've got a problem with this and you need to back off. It's like, you've got a behavior that you need to do. It's super important. It's the only way to engage well, but you also have this thought that you shouldn't be doing it as much. So it's this cognitive dissonance that I've brought Mm -hmm. up various times in various episodes where you're holding two expectations or beliefs. You can't do both. And so you have to go to one or the other. And so, you know, she had seen alcohol as a friend and an ally. It was helping her to make life better and manageable. And yet part of her was saying, we've got to let go of this friend. We've got to stop leaning into this friend. So what do we do? They then talked about, and I guess this is covered in the book, but they talked about the idea that sometimes when we hear something like this, like a book about alcohol or food addiction is the comparable thing that I think about. Oftentimes, a lot of us say, oh, that's not me. Oh, oh yeah, she has a problem with alcohol, but that's not me. I I don't actually have a problem with it. Oh, I'm not actually addicted to food. I I just, you know, I do this. And and we kind of separate out into us and them. And she said, you know, sometimes she encourages people to really move away from this approach of, well, do I have a problem with alcohol? because that brings up an uncomfortable set of decisions then. If we bring it up in that way, do I have a problem? First of all, none of us really want to acknowledge that we have a problem like that. But then if I do and acknowledge it, do I have to change it? And what's that gonna take? Oh man, am I gonna have to go to a bunch of meetings? Am I gonna have to go in treatment? What am I gonna have to do? And does this mean I can never do it again. Like we start to go down all of these uncomfortable paths. Yeah, because once you label something as a problem, the automatic response is, well, you're going to have to do something about it. (laughs) Yeah. And that again, this then leads you to start thinking of it. If I'm going to have to abandon this behavior and never have it again and do all of these hard steps to do that, we start to realize I'm denying myself something that I believe is necessary or useful or helpful. That's a complicated decision to have to make. So we then kind of lean into it and we start thinking, no, I don't have a problem because it really helps me. It's so good for me to be doing this or it's just who I am. It's how I was born. And so we, we kind of then focus on the ways we benefit from the behavior to hang on to it. And so she really encourages us instead to just think about, you know, I'm not broken. I don't have to identify, do I have a problem with this or not? Instead, be curious, common theme that you and I have talked about in various ways, but be curious. And instead, she would ask, am I happy or could I be happier if I change this behavior? Changes the question. Mm, Really does. And then... In that curious state, you start exploring, how does it make me happy? Is that as happy as I want to be? And those kinds of things. So then she started talking about, again, just kind of helping us to think about how we change things. And she said, how does a computer learn to play chess? Now, I don't know because I'm not a computer programmer. But the way she said it is basically, it makes a move. And then the other person wins and they're like, oh, okay, well, that move wasn't the right one. Let's play again. So every time they just keep learning, oh, when I do that, this happens. So the computer is just learning how to play. Mm. And then eventually, like, you can't beat the computer. It's so good. It needs data. That's right. And I don't remember exactly the phrase, but you just touched on data. She said, it's just gathering data. It's getting data that tells it, informs it which way to go. What works, what doesn't work? The computer never says, what's wrong with me? How come I didn't win this Mm, game? Doesn't feel anything about it. (laughs) That's right. And so this whole strategy really that she talks about really goes into the feeling piece of it. So again, experimenting is a big part of changing something that isn't making us happy, isn't serving us well. So she, again, went through the example with alcohol, but you could replace this with food or a certain type of food or spending money or over shopping or whatever. But she said, basically, if you think about it, you kind of learn a pattern. So for example, for her, it was drinking to avoid pain and to be able to relax. But 
if in doing that, you tack on this story, this piling on of messaging that is filled with guilt and shame, obviously, if I'm carrying guilt and shame, that causes pain. And how do I know to get out of pain? Drink. So by tacking on all of this negative self-assessment with it, we're actually likely to increase the behavior. So when I think about that, when I think about my clients at work, when they're working on changing some of their relationship with food, if they are talking to themselves in a way that's shame and guilt-based, that's going to create more discomfort, which is going to what? Turn us back to that comfort thing Mm -hmm. that we know alleviates the pain. So now I'm going to eat more of the problematic food. So it's really more not just in changing those behaviors, but changing how we are thinking and, and feeling about it and about ourselves. I remember reading something along those lines when I was trying to give up smoking. And it's that the false premise that smoking a cigarette relaxes you. Mm-hmm. Whereas it doesn't, and it it drives you to want another one. Mm-hmm. So yeah, you're actually making the problem worse. Mm-hmm. Having that sugar stops me feeling sleepy, or it, you know, it gives mm-hmm. me a bit of a buzz, or yeah, boosts that low blood sugar. Yeah, but it's causing the next time. <laughs> That's right. That's right. And she talks about that in a couple of different ways. So it kind of fixes the problem, yeah. but it fixes the problem that it's caused in the first place. That's, That's right. right. It's never ending, is it? It keeps the pattern going. Absolutely. Mm. And you need more and more of it. Yep. So she talked about one of the ways, actually, I think the host brought this up from the book. She said, you know, I love the way you say this about social settings because of the drinking is usually in social settings. Although when she was drinking heavily, she was doing it at home. She was Mm -hmm. doing it alone. She was hiding it, all of those Mm -hmm. um, behaviors. But what her point now is she doesn't say, I'm never going to drink again. And I know this breaks from every type of alcohol recovery program. She basically says it as, I drink as much as I want when I want to. I just haven't wanted to. And I think she's been sober for like 10 years. And so when people say, oh, can you have a drink with me? She says, actually, you know, you know, I don't want that. Um, I can have it, but I, I don't want it right now. But thank you. So just changing even that, she doesn't say I'll never drink again. And, and she even went into a little detail about this. She said, listen, if you say I'm never going to do this again, we measure success by 100% compliance. And she said, funnily enough, in other areas of life, we don't count only 100% as success. But in in these kinds of Mm. ways of thinking, we do. Mm. And she says, how are you going to know? Because you're going to die at some point. Maybe you haven't had any drinks, but then, but you're not going to get to evaluate if it was success or not. And so she just doesn't lean into that concept of just saying, I will never do this again. She believes in giving herself that I can do it whenever I want and however I want. I just don't want to. So again, that's really an empowered place, I think, to to be looking at this. Well, I think it it also immediately taps in in my mind into Gretchen Rubin's Four Tendencies. Mm -hmm. That very much taps into the rebel mindset. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to tell you you can't ever do something again. I'm going to leave the choice up to you. That's right. And again, it's individual, isn't it? How we react to different things. Mm -hmm. The delay, don't deny type thing works with me. Mm -hmm. Again, I went another Christmas without having a mince pie. And it was easier than last year. I didn't do that by saying I'm never going to have a mince pie again. (laughs) Because if I'd have done that, my rebel mindset would have been f you it would have been finagling ways to make sure that it got one this year i'm gonna eat a ton of mince pies that's right yeah i like that that approach appeals to me (laughs) i also like the way she talks about this you know um and this is something i describe a lot in my work about our interaction our relationship with food but she said you know using the escape behavior whatever that is prevents us from actually assessing what we need Mm. Of course, yeah. And, you know, she then shared some examples of thinking about the cause versus the symptom. 
And oftentimes we just want to stop the symptom, but we don't take the time then to figure out the cause. And so she shared an example of like um, going into a, a party with people or going to a club with people. And the reality is she doesn't like going to clubs. So she's uncomfortable. She's socially anxious. So what does she do to escape feeling uncomfortable? She would drink. Mm-hmm. And then she really didn't enjoy that either. But, you know, it was it was a behavior to address a need that she never really evaluated. And then it wasn't until later when she started to really get some feedback and think about this. You know, lots of people are anxious in the beginning of a social setting. They use the example of a kid's birthday party. If you watch the kids when they arrive at a birthday party, many of them will hang back at first. They're kind of clutching onto the parent's leg. They're watching, they're assessing, they're checking it out. Are these people fun? Anybody here going to hurt me? Are they doing things I want to do? And then they start to soften up to it and warm up and get into it. But what do we learn to do as adults? Well, I'll have three drinks so that I feel comfortable enough to go engage with these people. And again, I know this is specific to alcohol in this example, but I've done that certainly with food and other behaviors. And then again, in this example, talked about if I never explore the cause, I'm not going to take the steps to get what I need. So for example, ah, I need to learn more social skills. I don't need to learn social skills if I use the escape behavior. And again, that's often why some of us are using it. It's easier to go to the escape behavior rather than what do I actually need and how do I build that in? And she said, it's interesting because we don't we are better at doing this in other areas. So for example, if you're laying in bed and you're like, oh man, it is so hot. I don't feel like I can sleep. You go get a fan. You address the actual need. But when it comes to things like alcohol or problematic relationships with food or gambling or smoking or other drugs or whatever, we learn to avoid looking at the cause and just go to the relief. And I don't think that makes us pathological. That makes us logical. Let's Mm. go to the easiest solution here. Especially if it works, in quotation marks. (laughs) And then she talked about something that all of us probably have to work on, and that is learning how to handle the low level of discomfort of being different in a situation. So for example, if she weren't drinking in that situation, At work, I hear people often talk about, well, what if I don't eat what everyone's eating? Or what if I fast during that social gathering? That idea that we're doing something different, for her, it was that discomfort of, what if I look different than the others who are drinking? And so we, again, kind of, we feel the pressure almost to engage in a behavior, even though we know it's not helping us because we're uncomfortable with looking or feeling different. And she shared this example, and I don't know that I could do this in certain situations, but I thought it was really interesting. When she really got to a place where she just wasn't drinking anymore at these these gatherings, she noticed that, let's say, for example, the server comes to the table and starts with her. And like, what will you have? If she says, oh, I'll take an iced tea, she saw everyone around get kind of nervous, like, oh, she's not drinking. Should I not order a drink? is it okay to order a drink if she didn't? And then all of a sudden no one would order a drink and they were all uncomfortable or whatever. And so what she did in these situations, like I said, I don't know that I could do this. She learned to take some pressure off of her by orchestrating everyone else ordering their drinks. So she would stand up and like, okay, who's getting red wine tonight? Who wants a mixed drink? Are you having white wine? So she would orchestrate that. And then she would say to the server, And I'd like just water, please. So she didn't feel like she was responsible for influencing other people's decisions. Now, when it comes to food, I don't know that I could do that. I don't know that I could orchestrate what dessert everyone else was going to have and then say, I'll have coffee. But it's something worth trying. Well, and you can always do the, oh, I haven't decided yet. Go to everyone else first and come back to me at the end. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. By which time everyone's lost focus on you because they've put their order in. Thanks very much. That's a great reframe for that. Absolutely. So one of the things that this podcast talked about that was a a way of 
talking about it that I had not was not really familiar with, and I did go read an article about this just to learn a little bit more. But she calls it the liminal process, and that liminal actually is the space in between where you are and where you're going. And so if you think about physical liminidity, things like a bridge, that's liminal space. You were over here, you're going over here, you're in the in-between. But there's such stuff as psychological liminal space, and that is you're kind of between two thoughts or between two things. And again, if you think about that cognitive dissonance, I think I should be drinking less. I kind of get in trouble when I drink too much, but everyone's ordering another round of drinks. Maybe I should order another drink. You're in this space in between. This is that cognitive dissonance. So she talks about really using the liminal process, getting used to that space and being curious in it so that we can end that cognitive dissonance in our head and we can make the decision of which way to go in that space more conscious and less subconscious. Because again, as we've learned these patterns of addiction or patterns of use of a a certain behavior, it's become subconscious. We don't even think about it. So she then talked about just in, in essence, liminal thinking is about that space between conscious and subconscious. And we want to start to make these things more conscious. Um, We want to make what is subconscious known. And then once we're aware of it, we then can change the next step. We can change our behavior. But if we're not aware that we're in this liminal space and we're uncomfortable with it, we just go to what is natural, that subconscious pattern. And then we can work on rewiring our beliefs. So rewiring the belief, maybe alcohol isn't necessary for me to do okay in this situation, but I've got to experiment. I've got to tolerate some of that discomfort. And she used the example with alcohol, and she said um, what she always encourages people to do is pay attention to the result of using that behavior, so using alcohol. So when I have a drink, how do I feel? And then she went to some science about this that I thought was pretty interesting. She said, listen, for the first 20 minutes after that drink, your blood alcohol content, your BAC, increases, and that feels good. Then it drops. It's only 20 minutes in, and then it starts dropping, and that feels uncomfortable. So we can imagine what happens. As you said earlier, I use this behavior to feel that upswing that feels good, and then I drop. So I use the behavior again, and I probably use more of it, and then I don't wait 20 minutes because I don't want to feel that uncomfortable, so I just start drinking kind of continuously. That's, you know, me and a bag of cookies. I, you know, how long do you feel okay? When do you start to drop? And then how does that influence the behaviors? So partly learning to address that cognitive dissonance, testing this out. How do I actually feel when I do this? Helps give you some data, some information, and then it can help you change your beliefs. Like, hmm, maybe having more drinks isn't what's going to help me feel better. Maybe I could stop now so that I don't feel that increase and then drop. But if we don't experiment with it, we can't get that feedback. And then we use that feedback. And when we change our beliefs, so if I no longer believe alcohol is the only way I can get through this new situation, then you change how you feel. And when you change how you feel, it's easier to change the behaviors. So again, she doesn't say, I'll never drink again. She says, I can have it whenever I want, however much I want. I just don't want it. She then tacked on something here that I thought was so powerful, and I wish like the whole episode could have been about this, and it would have been helpful to me. But she said, without desire, there is no temptation. Hmm. Yeah. So no willpower is needed. And oftentimes when people are thinking about breaking some of these patterns or these addictions, they think, oh my gosh, I don't think I have that much willpower. Well, you probably don't. We need to work on it from a different angle so that we're not relying on willpower. So what she realized in doing this is that 
you know, it changed the belief, which changed the feeling. So now there was no longer the desire. Then I don't have to use willpower. So it's really kind of leveraging these other pieces. And again, she talked a little bit more about that idea of when you're in that state of cognitive dissonance, both parts of your mind, those different desires, those different wants, they both think what they want is what is going to help you the most. Mm. They're not evil. They think they're going to help you. So this part that says have another drink is because it knows it is going to help you career-wise if you join these people with drinks. The other part that's saying don't have any drinks tonight is saying I don't like how I feel after I drink. I don't, you know, have good experiences. They both want what is best for you. There's the conflict. So with that, what she suggested is kind of experimenting. And how you talk to yourself, as you and I have talked about so many times, really matters. If you say, what would it be like if I didn't have another drink? Or for me, what would it be like if I didn't eat more cookies? If I say to myself, I'm going to be miserable if I don't have another drink, I'm going to feel socially awkward and not be able to be okay. Then I will be. Yeah. But if instead we, we start to learn, I can feel fine when I don't have more. I can actually feel better in a few hours because I didn't keep drinking or keep eating that thing. Again, it's changing our beliefs, getting rid of that cognitive dissonance, which helps us change our feelings and then therefore change our behaviors. Yeah, that really reminds me of Richard Schwartz and his IFS approach to counseling and therapy where he says there are no bad parts and all these repetitive behaviors you have addictions you have they stem from a part of you that was going into survival mode it was helping you out it was helping you Mm -hmm. stop feeling the pain of that exile is is what they call it but that you know that locked away little child um, that it stems back from so it, it comes from a place of love. It comes from a place of trying to make you feel better. It just goes, you know, it just ends up running amok. Mm-hmm. That's a great example of a therapeutic approach that really kind of helps alleviate that dissonance, change the feelings, change the belief, therefore change the behavior rather than I need to eradicate this part of myself. Yeah, because it's a part of yourself. Yeah. And the whole the whole therapy model is talking to all of these parts, is mm-hmm. having a conversation, finding out, you know, why do you behave like that? What does it stem mm-hmm. back to? What is the root cause of that? Mm-hmm. What started it all off? And yeah, part of that conversation is quite often, and are you actually happy in the role that you have? Mm -hmm. You know, are you happy in your role as, you know, the the functioning alcoholic part of me? Are you happy in that role when I'm constantly having a go at you, constantly Mm -hmm. berating you? You know, no, actually, that part's not really very happy. It's doing its job to protect you, but it's not very happy in its role. Mm Mm-hmm. So it's, yeah, it sounds like I really like her take on things. Mm -hmm. And I love what you said about, well, the repeated phrase that she has throughout. Yeah, I'm not saying I can't ever have something again. I just choose not to. I don't want to. Mm -hmm. I can have it whenever I want it, but I don't want to. And turning that yeah if you can turn the desire off for something Mm -hmm. you don't want it we all know we all know what it's like yeah i could easily give up such and such or yeah that's not me i don't have a problem with that and you don't find out you have a problem with it until you until someone you know sets you the challenge not to have it for 30 days Mm -hmm. but i could quite happily Never again in my whole life eat fruit because I hate it. (laughs) That would be no challenge to me, but to somebody else, you know, my father who loves it, um, but has had to cut back on it for uh, looking at his blood sugar and all the rest of it. It's much more, you know, it's a real challenge for him. It's difficult. Mm -hmm. It's only ever difficult to give things up 
when we really want them. Mm -hmm. So yeah, if we can somehow manage to reframe things and not want them anymore, well, that's it, isn't it? The desire's yeah. gone. You don't need the willpower, like she says. The way you're saying that reminds me, based on something she said and the way I've talked about this with clients before, I think there's a big difference between I like that and enjoy it versus I can't not have it. And when we use that word want, like when she said, you know, I can have it whenever I want and however much I want, I just don't want it. I don't think she's really saying, I don't like it. I hate it. It's horrible. It's disgusting. No, she's saying, I don't want all that comes with it. Yes. I might enjoy the 10 minutes while I'm having yeah, yeah, the drink yeah. or the 20 minutes after mm. I have the drink, but I don't want that bigger picture. A client recently asked me like, Terry, come on. I mean, you never even want a cookie? Of course I do. <laughs> I said, of course I want a cookie. But to me, when I'm saying like, I enjoy them, but there's not this burning desire because I don't like the package that comes with the cookies. For me, that is um, glucose problems that lead me down a, a really complicated path. It is the after effect of wanting more cookies and then now feeling food obsessed. Like I can't stop thinking about them for the rest of the day or the rest of the week. So if you ask me, do I like cookies? Hell yeah, I love cookies. I don't want one right now. I don't want them right now. But, you know, maybe I could say I, I use a similar thing. that I can have them whenever I want and I can eat as many as I want. I just don't want that right now. And what I mean by that is I don't want all that that brings me. But it doesn't mean my like of cookies went away. My valuing of them went away because there's too much difficulty for me that comes with them and they aren't serving a positive enough purpose. So again, kind of going back to why would I use this? If I'm using cookies to avoid feeling uncomfortable and pain and whatever, I'm actually going to feel more of that after I eat cookies. So I, I hope that in kind of thinking about this again, although the topic is alcohol, if alcohol isn't your thing, like I don't drink. So I could think, well, this book doesn't even apply to me at all. But everything in this episode applies to me. I just substitute in my difficult thing of choice. And that for me is food. But I think there's so much in this episode and the whole concept of this liminal thinking, I think is really important that we are in the space of this decision. It's having this or having this. And the reality is we don't get to have both, that we have to go with one side or the other in, in these difficult choices. And that makes us uncomfortable. And what do we do? We resort to the one that we've been doing most frequently. Recently in the TFM community, someone said, you know, I'm frustrated because I wanted this certain kind of snack-like thing. I knew it wasn't good for me. And I'm just frustrated that I even still wanted it. And I'm like, oh man, as a human being, of course we still want it, even though we know it's not the best thing for us. So we have to keep working on how do we make those decisions. The, the want of things isn't going to go away. But it does not have to get to that increased level of desire when we're really in this different place of how we think about it and how we feel and the behaviors change. Yeah, I love that. I think, I think that's a really handy takeaway, very quick tip to reframe in your mind whenever you're thinking to yourself or you say, I want that straight away replace that with do I want what comes with that mm -hmm. so never again are you thinking I want that do I or do I not want what comes with that mm -hmm. do I want the package do I want the consequences do I want and I know it's sometimes easier said than done and more often than not it takes doing it over and over mm -hmm. and over again Certainly it has with me. What am I? What year is it for? So I'm 53. 
And it has taken me most of those years <laughs> to come to the understanding that gluten predominantly in the form of wheat products and I do not get on well. But I have abused that. I have pushed those boundaries over and over and over again. And it's only in the last few years that I will mostly, I'll have the odd thing, you know, it's got a bit of something in the coating or whatever that can fly under the radar. But I can't go having slices of toast. I can't go having cake. I can't go having regular pasta. I can't. Mm -hmm. Well, I can. I choose not to because I don't want what comes with it because I've learned now over and over and over what comes with it. Mm -hmm. And I know so well what comes with it that when I'm offered that choice, I don't want what comes with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want it. I want that mince pie. I'd love to eat that mince pie. I'd love to go out and buy a loaf of bread and eat it all in one night, probably with lashings of butter. I would love to do that. I want it. Yes, I absolutely want it. But I don't want what comes with it. <laughs> yeah, you don't want the whole yeah. shebang with it. But it's taken me an awful long time. <laughs> absolutely. You just reminded me of one last thing I wanted to say that she mentioned that this will perk the ears of some people because they've heard us talk about this before. But, you know, oftentimes people think, oh, how long does it take me to break a habit? How long does it take to make a new habit? And people are like, oh, 30 days, 60 days, 66 days, 90 days, all these different theories. More and more information is coming out by researchers like Lisa Feldman Barrett and BJ Fogg, who wrote Tiny Habits, and they say that it is actually less about how many times you've done the behavior, and it is more about how you feel. Mm. Yeah. So those of us who want that easy package of, you're going to have to do this 73.6 times until this is natural, that's going to be less of importance than that you work on this, how you feel about it. So you want to change habits, you want to improve better habits, build better habits, eliminate, you know, older habits. You're going to have to do some of these pieces that they're talking about. I can change how I feel about it by changing the beliefs that inform those feelings, getting rid of that cognitive dissonance. Because if I feel uncomfortable every time I tell myself, no, you can't have a cookie. No, you can't have a cookie. That's cognitive dissonance. I want a cookie. I know it's bad for me. And when I feel bad about that, then, and I feel guilty and negative, then I'm more likely to need it to alleviate that bad feeling. Mm. But if instead I feel good about the choice, I feel congruent with my goals and I feel excited that I got to go through that day without leaning into that thing, that's going to change the habit more than just how many times I repeat it. And I think also accepting that you can kind of feel a bit sad about not, you know, choosing not to have it. Absolutely. Because, yeah, you acknowledge the fact that it would have maybe been enjoyable to have whatever it is, but mm -hmm. on balance... It's not the choice that I want to make. Yeah. Because how many of us have actually locked in place pretty well a new habit by spending 30 days, 60 days, 90 mm -hmm. days, whatever it is, and doing it really faithfully. And then that one time mm -hmm. you do the old thing, you feel it all slip away mm -hmm. because you haven't changed that feelings piece. Or because you tack on a bunch of guilt and shame that you did that yeah. behavior. Yeah. Like she doesn't talk about relapse. She just calls those data points. Hmm. I had a cookie today and I haven't had cookies in three years. Huh? I had a cookie today. What's that about? You know, what, what, what was going on? How does that feel? How do I, was that satisfying? Did it bring up other things? It's not a fail. It's a data point. Mm. So all kinds of good stuff. I swear. Yeah. This is, really you good. know, man, I, I feel like I have 400 books I need to read right now, but this one goes <laughs> on the list because I think it really is applicable. Even though an area of struggle for me is not alcohol, everything about the way she talked about it fits exactly with areas that I do struggle with. So I encourage people to um, think about this episode Maybe go listen to the episode themselves, read the book, because um, I think it can be really helpful. 
Yeah, sounds it. Certainly someone I'd like to go listen to. In the meantime, I hope you have a very wonderful week until I see you again. Take good care, everybody.